Well, hey, Emmaus family, Micah here, and uh, we are in the last moments, if you will, uh, of, of kind of our separation and watching these videos uh, as far as the only means uh, to uh, us to kind of gather together around God's word and a teaching and a single thread that kind of unites us all. I am just overjoyed that next week we will be together and I will be teaching in person and we will be worshiping in person and we will have communion in person at our building in celebration of Easter. Man, what a day it's going to be. I'm super, super excited to do that with all of you. Uh, but here I am uh, in my backyard uh, on my deck. So you might hear some birds, a dog bark, some cars honking. Um, and, but what a year it's been. I can't believe that we'll have spent 55 weeks doing this. I can't believe how long I have uh, been teaching to a camera and not to your faces. And uh, it brings me uh, joy to just think about next week and how things are going to change. Um, at the same time, I know once I get there, There'll be pieces of this that I'll probably have some kind of uh, weird relationship, like with a hostage, with a with a hostage taker situation. I forget what that that syndrome is called, but I'll have some weird affinity for this. Uh, probably when we're done, but I'm looking forward to next week. And I'll, uh, but here we are. It's Palm Sunday weekend, and so uh, we want to just jump into God's word. And uh, let me pray, and we'll do just that. God. We're grateful. We're grateful that you have walked step by step with us through this season, through this time. And uh, we don't want to just wish it away. We don't want to just throw it off and be like, oh, that was the worst thing that ever happened to us, ever happened to uh, Emmaus Church. Uh, God, no, help us to continue to learn. Help us to be open. Help us to see with correct eyes and hear with correct ears and uh, all that you're doing and now we give ourselves to that today in your word uh, as we celebrate Palm Sunday which commenced one of the greatest weeks uh, this world has ever known and so we uh, look into your word to be instructed about those things Holy Spirit come it's your name we pray amen well, if you want to go ahead and uh, get your Bible open to John 12, we're going to spend a lot of time there, John 12, uh, Zechariah 9, and uh, we're taking a little bit of a break from Revelation uh, for this, these two weeks, but I'm, I'm hoping to have some, some tie-ins for, uh, for both weeks because it's not absolutely foreign, but I just want to take some time to set aside uh, the story of the Passion Week, and like I just prayed, uh, one of the most significant weeks in not just Christians' lives, but we believe it's one of the most significant weeks in the history of mankind because of what was happening that week in Jerusalem. What happened at the end of that week is Jesus gave his very life for everyone, died, was buried, rose again and how he ended death's reign over us over mankind over creation and set us on a trajectory up for which we can follow him so it's good news that's the gospel that's the heart of the gospel what jesus has done what god has done what god has done to pursue a people throughout history culminating perfectly in the giving of himself, the giving of his son uh, for the sins of the whole world uh, to make propitiation and to, to set right, to gather his people. And we've been talking about that, haven't we? We've been talking about that in Revelation. We've been talking about the reality that is a God gathering his people around his throne. And that's what the book of Revelation does at the end of like revealed scripture that we have. But the story has been going on and it's happening in the gospels and so while in revelation we've had this kind of high exalted vision of who christ is as god on his throne the lamb slaughtered next to the throne full glory honor just unbelievable imagery here we're going to kind of go back we're going to look as jesus rides into town and he's a gentle savior but yet it's a gentle glory 
It's the king of glory that Psalm 24 talks about. This king of glory who comes riding in. And who is this king of glory? Who is this one who is worthy as he comes in there as the psalmist King David writes in Psalm 24. Last week, you know, we talked about these four horsemen of the apocalypse, and I said something about this, these kind of horsemen used as these ushering of what the, the, the fall has been like or what uh, the, the, the destruction, if you will, that sin uh, has brought on us that we participate fully in, that we are not above or beyond. Um, and I said next week Jesus will be riding in in a completely different tone. And that's no joke because you see here, chapter 12, John's gospel, that's where we're going to be. Verse uh, 12, uh, John, the same John who is writing the Revelation, uh, is recounting these things years later. And he says, uh, verse 12, the next day a large crowd had come to the feast this is the Passover. Again, uh, this is Passover week. Uh, this is where the high uh, feast of feast for uh, the the Jews at this time. This is when they remembered uh, the Exodus, what they what they were saved from, as God brought them on by His hand out of Egypt, redeeming them from slavery. Um, and this is the once a year observance uh, of this of that uh, ritual where they would celebrate a meal and there would be a Passover lamb and uh, they would celebrate the flight from Egypt and this the door, the blood on the doorpost saving the firstborn of Israel. So, so much imagery is going on. And so this smallish, but big at that time, small in, in our minds, uh, 50 to 70,000 people uh, had swo swollen, if you will, to at least 250,000 scholars debate, but maybe even upwards of a million people had flooded into this town. And Jesus and his disciples were there in Jerusalem, right in the thick of it. And Jesus had been doing stuff. He had just uh, been in Bethany with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. He had just healed Lazarus, but more than healed, he had raised Lazarus from the dead. We know that story. You, you should know that story. If you haven't, go back. Just so much tenderness there from Jesus. And so we know from the other Gospels that he rides into Jerusalem and he looks and he sits there and he weeps as he comes in to Jerusalem. We went through that in Luke's Gospel, Mark's Gospel, uh, Matthew's Gospel. Those, those realities where Jesus comes in, looks at this city full of people, and he says, I love these people. I long to gather these people like a mother gathers uh, her, her chicks. So here he is. The triumphal entry, maybe your Bible says, that's what mine says right here. But he says, the next day, large crowds had come to the feast. Heard Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took the branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it just as it is written. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. So right away, they're meeting Jesus. He's riding to town on this donkey's colt. Uh, the other gospels go into some painstaking detail about the, the process it was of, of finding this donkey, getting it from its owner. I need this. Uh, you can go read about them but here, but John just tells us, uh, he's presuming that we know those other gospels. He's saying, this donkey, you know the story. Jesus is riding on it. And this was to fulfill Zechariah 9. That's a small prophet book at the very end of the Old Testament. Uh, just go to Matthew, turn back a couple pages. You can find it there. We'll go to Zechariah 9 in, in just a few moments. Because I want to spend some time there to see the glories of coming out in this passage that John is pulling out to us. But this reality here that these people are excited. They're excited to see Jesus. Now, John goes on to tell us that the, one of the reasons that they're excited is because this crowd, that's what's going on there in verse 17, this crowd had just been with Jesus in Bethany. And there was this hubbub happening because he had raised someone from the dead. Someone who had been dead three days. It wasn't just a phantom. It wasn't just 
well, maybe he was sick. No, everyone at this time knew this guy was dead and Jesus just raised him from the dead. So he had become somewhat of a celebrity. And so, you know, as this burgeoning population was there, that the word was just spreading like wildfire, that, that this, this Jesus guy, not only was he speaking as one who had authority, not as only had a bunch of the people known him for now three plus years or heard about him for three plus years, but now it's kind of like reaching its crescendo as he's really healing some of the dead people. And he's now he's walking or coming into uh, Jerusalem with his disciples at this very opportune time. And so the people, they're, they're waving branches. Now, some people, scholars, that is, they, they would say, well, uh, this this Hosanna that some people thought this was going to be this act of, of, of insurrection. Some say, well, this actually places this story not at Easter, but back in the Feast of Tabernacle, which is in the fall by the Day of Atonement uh, and Yom Kippur and those that season. Um, but the reality of it is it had become a pervasive thing to just celebrate uh, with palms. It was very prevalent uh, plants around that time. And they're celebrating, and they're celebrating their king. Now, they did not know fully what that meant. We see that happening throughout the Gospels. There's people are saying things, especially during this Passion Week, that they don't know what they are talking about. But it's playing right into Jesus' hands. It's playing right into God's hands. It's playing right into everything that we know about how God's working His plan. And He's continuing to come for His people. And so they're waving these branches. And this is, there's, there probably is some measure of insurrection, but because the reality is they're saying Hosanna and translate it says, save us now. They're saying, save us now. Blessed are you. Blessed are we. You know, probably they don't even know what's going on, but they're saying like, dude, you can raise the dead. We need this to happen. We're being a, a you know, oppressed. Some felt that way. I'm sure that was going on. Others were enjoying the lap of luxury, being Roman citizens or being at least accepted by the Rome, by Rome, and and all the things that were going on. But either way, as Jesus rolls in, here is the reception, and Jesus is not on what you might think. But on the other hand. If there were people who knew their Old Testament, and a lot of them did, they either knew it or should have known it because this is talked about explicitly. That's why John writes back. He's saying this was that. He's editorializing. He's, he's connecting the dots for his readers, uh, you know, writing almost a century after these events took place. And he's writing, he's saying that donkey, that donkey that uh, Zechariah told us about, he came in. He was fulfilling that. He was working the plan that he knew was going to happen since he participated in creation. And he's presenting. And he's coming in. And this presents us with kind of exactly where I want to go um, today. And kind of the, the main thrust of everything that I want to say is that as Jesus came into Jerusalem, these people have been walking some of them with him for three full years some of them we don't know some of them we do know the namely the 12 the disciples now some of these leaders and chief priests and Caiaphas and Pilate and Herod and I don't all of the religious leaders we don't know how many of them knew and heard about Jesus and how long it, the Bible doesn't tell us always about that but one thing that we do know is as he comes into Jerusalem for this final time on this final week. And at the same time, they, although they thought they knew who Jesus was, or they had been turned off to who Jesus was, maybe from some of the things he said, you know, he said some hard sayings. We, we get that all through the Gospels that people are like, well, this is a hard saying, and people walked away. John 6 and the other parts of John and the other Gospels to the leaders who are pushing back. Hey, this is not who are, are people even just questioning? Even John the Baptist was questioning like, hey, should we expect someone else? Are you the one who's to come? Or, or, or I'm, this isn't, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of confused here. So the reality of it is there's people expecting a wide gamut 
of realities of who this person is and what he's come to do. And I just want us to know, and I want you to know, that as you sit there today on this Palm Sunday, as we go into this week, as we have just experienced a COVID year, as we've experienced the year that we've had as Emmaus Church together, as you have had to live your life with your family and with those things, that we've all experienced different things. We've all come from different places. But Jesus comes and he is in full control. And it's glorious. And it's going somewhere. And he's gentle. And he's lowly. And our expectations are challenged by that. You see, we, there's this gentle glory that he is just coming into Jerusalem with. There's a gentle glory that he lived with. And there's a gentle glory that he just can, he went through the finish line of life with. The author of Hebrews tells us that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. So we know that's where we're headed this week. So this week, as we come to uh, Holy Week, as we come to the, the culmination of Easter, even as we as Emmaus Church come back together, and it's going to be a new joyous occasion um, as we gather even around the table the table of the elements, the table of having a picnic together next week. We are an expecting people, just like these people were an expecting people. You had the groups of the disciples, you had the groups of the crowd, and you had the religious establishment. And no matter where these people were coming from, like I said, we all come from different places. They should have been getting certain things. And Jesus keeps coming. And Jesus doesn't always fit neatly and tightly into their ex expectations. But it causes them to begin, ask the question, who is this guy? And am I seeing him for who he is? And what he wants to be seen as? Or am I seeing him as I want to see him? Am I judging him based on the experience that I've had of being 20 feet back in a crowd? Am I, am I judging him based on the experience of being healed or raised from the dead? Am I judging him by living with him for three years? Am I judging him because he's coming for my precariously held position of power as the religious establishment such as the Pharisees? You see, because what we expect of Jesus starts to taint how we receive him. It starts to and affect how we follow him. It starts to change what we expect from him. It starts to change how we see what he does and the words that he says. But the good news is that Jesus just keeps coming. And here we know that he keeps coming and coming and coming all the way to the cross, all the way to hell, as the Apostles' Creed says, all the way out the grave with the disciples again, and all the way in to heaven, uh, seated in glory. And one of the things that I'm always struck with, because I read as I read the Gospels, is how it, Jesus is constantly just taking his disciples and the crowds and the religious establishment and all who come into contact along with him. At the same time, he never relents in making demands of these people. And not demands like we typically think of demands because the, his demands were always wrapped up in and of himself. You see, we celebrate the Incarnation. And we celebrate the Incarnation because it's this idea of God becoming man. I and mean, that's what we talk about at Christmas. And we, we talk about it a lot as Christians. And so there is this reality that, that Christ, God, has entered into our world. He has become man. He has entered time. He has entered the, like our finiteness. 
he is he knows as the author of Hebrew also talks about our weakness he knows your weakness as a man as a woman as a kid as a teenager he's well acquainted Isaiah 53 talks about with our ways he's felt your feelings he's experienced your disgust he's had questions especially in this week of Gethsemane he's even questioning his father like is there any other way is there any other means he's fine with doubt he's fine with questions but the reality and the gloriousness of this gentleness and this glory and this melding of this person who Jesus is is that as we get in these this final week it becomes painfully obvious as he continues every relationship is pointed every conversation disciples Herod cleansing the temple every interaction with every single person is there is so much agenda there is so much packed into every single statement every single word my Bible doesn't have red letters sometimes those are crazy but if you have a Bible with red letters just look at the red red letters in this final week, all the stuff that Jesus is saying. And what I'm started to notice is, and this is true of Jesus' entire public ministry, but it's so explicit in this Passion Week, is that Jesus is kind of turning everything on its head. So it's not just the tables in the temple courts that he begins to overturn. He's turning over whole paradigms, and these paradigms are... Guys, what you need to understand is that I'm not just entering into your world. You're not living just living in. I'm. It's not just me living in your world, and you should uh, get out of me or from me what you want to live in your world. No, he's saying no. It's my world. I am the Creator God. I am Jesus, God, walking earth. And I'm going to remedy all of this. I'm coming for you. Do you have doubts? I've got you. Do you have fears? I've got you. Have you been hurt? I've got you. Have you been turned off by religion? I've got you. Have I been given a bad name by others to you? I got you. What do you expect from me? I want in. You know, a couple weeks ago, we were talking about Jesus is the door knocking from Revelation there in chapter uh, four or five and the end of the, uh, the as he's talking, the, ch the church is there in, in chapter three of Revelation. And this is who Jesus is. He's, he's coming in. He's, he's knocking his way in to Jerusalem on this donkey. And he's saying, I don't know what your expectation is. You might even be say, saying, save me, Hosanna. You might have thought I was coming in on a war horse to defeat Rome, to defeat that power that you feel like is holding you down, but that is not what I'm doing on the surface. It's what I'm doing ultimately. Because will he defeat the power? Yes. Is he in total power? Uh-huh. He is in complete control. And this final week as he comes for us, at the cross, as he comes for humanity on the cross, as he comes for, as the language here, the whole world, he's in complete control. And he's showing us that it's his world and we're just living in it. But not just living in it. He's created it for us to live in as his ambassadors, as his agents of reconciliation. This is the message. This is what he was training the disciples to do. He's like, abide in me, walk with me, talk with me, follow me. I will make you. I am bringing dead things to life. I am healing. I am mending. I am breaking down walls that need to be broken down. And all of these things that we saw Jesus do for his three years, he does to finally at the cross because it's the power and reign of sin had to be broken. And now he's placed his spirit here and he's given you and me the keys, if you will, to walk it out. 
here and now, the resurrection life, the cross life, the cruciform life, following after him. You see, he came gentle on this donkey, feet dragging on the ground, tear filled, because he knew that's the type of savior he would be, a suffering servant king, and he's taking his world back, you see. But this is not what they saw. You have three groups of people here, John 12. His disciples, as he rode into town, they didn't understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered these things that had been written about him and had been done. You see, the disciples didn't get it. They only remembered after he died, after he came back, after he was glorified, after he explained stuff there on the Emmaus Road and their hearts burned within him. Then they understood. They understood what he was doing when he was riding in, but they didn't get it. The people who were most intimate with him. The crowd, well, they got it a little bit more than the disciples, which is astounding, which is a which should speak to all of us that the, sometimes the crowd begins to get it even more than the people closest to him. At the same time, some of them are getting it because it says the reason was is that they had seen the signs. They were with him. They saw someone raised there. Of course they got it. You see, they were just entrapped, enthralled by the sign. Someone rose from the dead, but they didn't know who the heck Jesus was. They're like, well, whoever you are, do something because you can raise people from the dead. This wasn't real knowledge of who he was. So you had the disciples who walked with him, who knew him intimately, but it was old hat. They didn't understand the signs. They weren't connecting the dots of what God was doing in the total picture of redemptive history. At the same time, the the crowd didn't know who Jesus was, literally from Adam, but they were hungry for what he could do. And then the third one, the Pharisees, verse 19, they said to one another, you see, you're gaining nothing. They're saying to one another, look at the world going after him. You can almost hear their their foaming at the mouth, seething this. They're jealous. They're trying to hold on to things. You see, just right back before this, at the beginning of chapter 12, they're trying to plot to kill him. And not to plot just to kill him only, but they want to kill Lazarus, who he just, Lazarus, who he just raised from the dead. The religious leaders wanted to kill someone. They were murderous because of their hatred for Jesus, because of his clearing out, his toppling, if you will, of their precariously held, self-absorbed power that they thought they had. They liked their position, and Jesus was coming for it. You see, the Pharisees liked the religion that was propping them up. They didn't really like to have their categories messed with by Jesus. They didn't like this humble, lowly king. They didn't like this gentle savior. They didn't like that there were going to be people around the temple or the throne, if they even got that, from every tribe and tongue and nation. The crowd, they just wanted some signs. They just wanted some wonders. They just wanted stuff healed. They just wanted sickness is taken care of and so they could be on their merry way they didn't want religion which was probably good they didn't want a relationship like the disciples had but you see the disciples they had all the relationship but they still didn't get it because they had pieces of the crowd in them they had pieces of the pharisees in them you see that's how john's weaving the story just before this Judas Iscariot, he's upset that they're anointing Jesus' feet with oil. He's like, we could have used this for better stuff. Why are you using so much money just to like waste it on Jesus' feet? And right there, it's just devastating to me as I read that because it's just proving that he had no knowledge of who this was. And that's the point that John tells him. So you have these three groups of people just like you and me right here at the outset of the Passion Week. 
and that Jesus comes and he tells the Zechariah 9 thing. And Jesus tells it, not through teaching. John's the one doing that. Jesus grabs the donkey and he gives a life lesson. And he rides it in. And what's going on in Zechariah 9, and we'll kind of close right here, is that this is the prophecy. It says here, verse 9, Zechariah 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O Jerusalem. So rejoicing, shouting, that should be the response when we see the long-expected Jesus. So as you see Jesus, what is your response? As you're given a picture of this Savior now and in Holy Week, Easter and forward, what, what is your response, church? And he says, Behold, your King... Look at him. Behold your king. He's coming to you. He's righteous and he has salvation. Having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey. That's that gentle place. And he's on a colt, the foal of donkey. And he says, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem. And he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pits. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double. Well, this is what's going on when Jesus rides that into Jerusalem. It's not just he's driving a donkey and what's in a donkey? Well, not only were they supposed to be getting back there, these realities of Zechariah 9, that that was what was prophesied to his people of what things that were to come, things that were to be undone, things that were to be reestablished by this Messiah. But the reality of it is, is he says right there, verses 10 and 11, is that he's going to end all wars. And how is he going to end all wars? He's going to do it by bringing peace to the nations, not just peace between people who uh, can kind of agree, not peace because there's uh, the Pax Romana, that peace of Rome that they'll be doing because they're just happen to be in power and, and they're just going to kind of squash everyone with the weight of their kind of self-imposed rule because, hey, we're the, the top guy, uh, you know, the top guy on the heap. No. There's going to be a once and for all total peace. There's going to be a once and for all total cessation of war. And both of those things, how are they accomplished? He says, because of the blood of my covenant for you, I will set your prisoners free. That lowly of the lowly in society, the prisoner, are going to be set free. Now, in Zechariah, that's kind of some cryptic talk. But if we know now where we sit, you and me in the church today, we know that there is a literal prisoners that will be set free, but there is also a figurative prisoners. And that's also you and me. And that was the world. And that was what was going on is there is a world held captive to the principalities and powers of the air, to Satan and to sin. And what was Jesus doing but coming to take them to the cross and going to be disarming them so that then he can set this free for a final time. And that's why we can't wait till he returns because everything's going to be done away with. He will ride in finally in Revelation 19. This talks about on that war horse, a brilliant white stallion. His blood, his robe is going to be soaked in blood. He's going to have a sword coming out of his mouth. His face is going to be on fire. Because you see, at the end of this week, when he rides in Jerusalem, he knows he's going to give his life. He's going to pour out his blood. And that blood, as the author of Hebrews just tells us, is going to speak, speak a much, much better word. And blood of bulls and goats. It's going to speak a much better word than some type of power contract where you have to be a responsible party and you are this other person's responsible party. If someone doesn't hold up their end of the bargain, that you can null and void that contract. No, it's a blood of a covenant, the blood written 
in the very blood of the God-man Jesus, gentle and lowly. And because of that, he's going to break down, Paul says in Ephesians 2 and 3, the dividing wall between you and me and other people who we feel are unlike us. He's going to restore us all into one flesh himself, his flesh. And he's bringing an alien righteousness. He's coming to us. He is righteous and he's bringing salvation. It's not our own pulling ourselves up by the bootstraps. No, he's bringing something for you and for me. That's what he did at the cross. That's what he did for all in Jerusalem. That's what he did for the disciples, the crowds, and the Pharisees. And the question becomes, do we see our need for saving? Do we see our need for relationship? Do we see our need for not the sign, not the raising from the dead, not the healing? But do we see our need for the hand that heals? The man that that hand is attached to, Jesus. So Jesus is riding in. And he's writing in that last time. But as we have our Bibles and as we talk about it, as we celebrate this week after, or this week, year after year, we know he continues to write in. And your life, your Mondays, your year by year, every situation that you find yourself, every situation we find ourselves in, us, he is coming writing in. How will we receive him? Who are we expecting? So this week, as you walk through uh, the Holy Week, uh, get in your Bibles. We're going to post uh, readings, the, just the, the Gospels broken up uh, throughout this week, Monday, Sunday, Monday, Sunday through the next Sunday. If you can look in the Gospels and, and just read about G- Jesus' interactions on um, this final week of his life. But just really ask yourself those questions. Who was I expecting? How would I have responded to Jesus? Because the same is still true of us. We have a response to this one who will make war cease, who will bring all nations together by his blood free prisoners. That's where we're going. That's what we're celebrating this week. And that's what the Pharisees, the crowd, and the disciples had a response to, what's our response going to be? Well, that'll be seen at the end of this week. What is your response going to be? Will you let Jesus speak for himself? Will you let Jesus ride into your life? Will you accept him as the gentle, glorious Savior that he is? Are you going to kick against the goads, wanting something more? wanting something better or at, or demanding even less. Maybe you just feel like, I, I don't know, Mike, I, I just, I, I'm, I'm just too needy for Jesus right now. I just need too much. Well, listen to this in closing. Dane Ortland writes here, about how Jesus sees you, sees me, and sees Jesus' lowliness as something to attach ourselves to, or rather, how he attaches himself to us. He says, we are buoyed along in life by his endless gentleness and supremely accessible lowliness. He doesn't simply meet us at our place of need. He lives in our place of need. He never tires of sweeping us into his tender embrace. It is his very heart. It's what gets him out of bed in the morning. That's true of Jesus. Now, (laughs) it gets him out of bed to meet you where you are. It was definitely true so many years ago before he rode that donkey that beast of burden into Jerusalem, what got him out of that, out of bed that morning was the neediness, was the prisoners, was the division, was the wars, was whatever is going on in each of those person's life and whatever is going on in your life. So who are you expecting? How would you receive him? Because he loves you and he wants you 
and their relationship with you is what gets him up out of bed in the morning, still to this day. It's what brought him into Jerusalem on that day, and it's what took him to the cross. So we celebrate that this week. I love you guys, and I'll see you next week.